So with nucleophilic substitution, there's some rate of reaction factors that you need to be aware of. Now, some of them are more from the chemical kinetics topic, the HL portion, so I'm gonna leave that for now. And I'm gonna focus on some factors that affect the rate of reaction for nucleophilic substitution reactions that aren't from the traditional list of, you know, temperature, surface area, etc., that we talk about with collision theory. So one of those factors is the identity of the halogen atom that's on the halogen or alkane. Um, and if you think about the mechanism, this bond needs to break in order for the reaction to take place. So the weaker this bond is, the faster the reaction can happen. And so what we've talked about previously with covalent bonds is that as atomic radius increases, so the atoms get bigger, then the covalent bond strength goes down. And so as we go down the periodic table, fluorine to chlorine to bromine to iodine, we're getting larger atoms, and that means that the bond between carbon and the halogen gets weaker. And as the bond gets weaker, we're essentially lowering the activation energy of the reaction because this is part of the energy input that needs to take place as this bond needs to break. So with weaker bonds, lower activation energy, we get faster reaction rates. So of all the halogen alkanes, we would expect the iodoalkanes to react the most quickly. Then we can move on to the nucleophile. Now mostly you just are asked to focus on hydroxide as the nucleophile. There are other, many other nucleophiles possible, things that have lone pairs of electrons that they can donate uh, to the halogen alkane to cause this reaction, one of which is water. And water is very similar uh, to hydroxide in that the product produced would be an alcohol as well. Um, but because the hydroxide has the negative charge, uh, we would expect the hydroxide to be more reactive, to be more attracted to that carbon in the halogen and alkane, and therefore um, we would say hydroxide would be faster than water. So if we have to decide between two nucleophiles, the one that has the negative charge will be faster than one that's neutral. Third, uh, the classification of the halogen alkane. We've talked about um, the fact that different halogen alkanes are more or less likely to undergo different mechanisms. So primary halogen alkanes only undergo the SN2 mechanism um, because they don't have any steric hindrance from multiple carbon branches. Uh, that means it's fairly easy for a nucleophile to uh, do a backside attack uh, against the carbon atom. Um, they also don't form very stable carbocations because they only have hydrogens mostly surrounding the carbocation, which don't provide much stability. Now, the tertiary ones undergo SN1 exclusively. Uh, that's because they have multiple carbon atoms surrounding the carbocation, which have a positive inductive effect, so they have a stable carbocation. Um, they also have a lot of steric hindrance from those uh, extra carbon groups, which prevent the backside attack of SN2 from taking place. And then we've talked about how secondary can do either. So typically it's sort of a mix of doing SN1 and SN2. Well, of the two mechanisms, SN1 is considered to be the faster mechanism because it has a lower activation energy. The transition state of SN2 has a high activation energy. That thing that we draw with the dotted line like this, that is considered to have a high activation energy and that equals slow. So as a result of those mechanisms and the rel relative activation energies, we would expect tertiary halogen alkanes to react the fastest and primary to react the slowest. Now, how do these things typically come up in IB questions? Typically, these come up on paper one. Um, and so they give you combinations of different halogen alkanes, and um, and then they say, okay, so which which will be the fastest combination? So typically, what you're choosing between is factor one and three. I would say are the most common, and so you're looking at something that's primary with chlorine, and then primary with bromine, and then tertiary uh, with bro, sorry, chlorine, and tertiary with bromine, something like that. So 
imagine, I'm not taking the time to write out the halogen or alkane, but if these were your four choices, the way I typically figure out the correct answer is by getting rid of wrong answers. So I go through and I say, well, I know that primary, or maybe let's say the halogen first, that's easier to remember. Um, I know that the larger the halogen, the weaker the bond, the faster the reaction rate. So I'm going to immediately get rid of both choices that have chlorine, because chlorine is a smaller uh, atom with a stronger bond. So it's definitely not going to be my fastest option. And then I think about, okay, I've got tertiary versus primary. This is about SN1 versus SN2. SN1 is faster, so I'm going to get rid of the primary halogen or alkanes as options because they'll exclusively do SN2, which I know is the slower option. And so only answer D has both um, tertiary, which is the faster option, and bromine, which is the faster halogen option. So this, that's probably the most common way that this content comes up is in some sort of uh, multiple choice question. Usually it's pretty easy to eliminate wrong answers so that you get the best answer left behind. But there is a final factor, which I have seen come up on paper too. Not very common, but it is possible. And it's everyone's least favorite. Um, so you can also uh, use different solvents to run these reactions. So these reactions are taking place in some kind of organic solution. And depending on the nature of the solvent, you can uh, encourage different mechanisms or speed up different mechanisms. So the difference here, both in both cases, we've got polar solvents. So really the, the main thing to focus on here is that some solvents are protic and some are aprotic. And that's a term that we may have used when we talked about hydrogen bonding, but you should think of the term proton and you should immediately think of hydrogen. And so a protic solvent is one that has hydrogen Specifically, it has an O to H or an N to H hydrogen, so it's capable of hydrogen bonding and of really being like a hydrogen donator in that hydrogen bond. So this includes things like water, um, things like methanol or ethanol, things like methylamine. So these solvents, these organic compounds that have the ability to form hydrogen bonds, as opposed to an aprotic solvent, is something that's polar but it doesn't have that H enough hydrogen. So this would be something like propanone or acetone, right? Um, this could be something like a nitrile or an ether. So this would be like diethyl ether it is uh, aprotic, doesn't have a hydrogen on the oxygen. It is polar slightly, um, but it's an aprotic solvent. So you're basically just trying to remember the terms for something that can form hydrogen bonds on its own versus something that can't. Now, why do these have an influence? Well, um, the main way that the polar protic solvents help, they're uh, helpful influencing SN1, increasing the rate of SN1 reactions, because SN1 reactions, unlike SN2 reactions, have this intermediate that forms that's a carbocation. So you form a full ion um, in the middle of this mechanism. And things that are protic, things that are hydrogen bonding capable, um, because of that hydrogen bond and that strong bond between O and H, where you have a very partially negative you know, oxygen atom, as the case may be, with this solvent that I'm imagining, uh, those oxygen atoms can orient themselves around this carbocation and they can stabilize the carbocation. And that essentially means you're lowering, well, you think of it as lowering the activation energy. You're making it uh, more energetically favorable for this reaction to happen. So polar protic solvents, solvents that are capable of hydrogen bonding, help encourage the SN1 mechanism. They help make the SN1 mechanism even faster because they're able to stabilize the intermediate, the carbocation. The polar aprotic solvents uh, are able to increase the rates of SN2 mechanism. Um, that's because uh, the nucleophile, the hydroxide, well, if you mixed it with a, um, a polar protic solvent, the ion would be surrounded by the polar protic solvent. It would sort of stabilize that ion. Whereas when you use a aprotic solvent, they're not able to attract very well to the nucleophile. And so the nucleophile becomes 
even less stabilized. So they destabilize the nucleophile because they, uh, they can't form strong attractions with the nucleophile. Okay, so you've got, now that would be the same case, they would destabilize the nucleophile in the SN1 case, but they would also destabilize the carbocation, so they'd have a, an overall sort of canceling out their effect. But in the SN2, there is no carbocation to destabilize. So in SN2, these polar aprotic solvents, they destabilize the nucleophile, they make it more reactive, and therefore they increase the reaction rate um, as a result of destabilizing the nucleophile. So this last topic, the one about the solvent, is definitely the most complicated to explain and probably the least commonly asked about. So uh, do your best to remember this, this detail, but there's a lot of detail in the organic chemistry options, so um, do your best.